Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to this Onward panel event on building connectivity. How can we best harness digital infrastructure to level up the country, uh, held in partnership with Vodafone UK? Uh, my name is Will Tanner. I am the director of Onward, a think tank whose mission it is to renew the centre right uh, for the next generation by coming up with bold and practical new ideas and reaching out to new groups of people. Uh, over the course of the next hour or so, we are going to get into one of the most important, one of the most urgent issues of the moment, uh, an issue that I suspect many of you have felt pretty keenly over the last nine months. And that's uh, how to uh, leverage, how to level up um, the UK's uh, digital infrastructure and bring prosperity to all parts of the UK, because, as you all know, it is our digital infrastructure, not necessarily our roads or rail lines that has sustained our economy during some of the darkest times in recent decades over the last few months. Um, those of you who have decamped from your office to your living room will know just how critical it is to have a decent internet connection. Um, those of you who run or represent high street businesses will know that the pivot to click and collect and uh, e-commerce and delivery um, would not have been possible just a few years ago um, uh, and be thankful for the uh, enormous leaps and bounds that our digital infrastructure has, has come on in recent years. Um, the shift to digital has both accelerated and become entrenched during this pandemic. Um, the government is already doing lots on this front and I'm delighted uh, that we've got the minister here to tell us more about that um, from 5G test beds to uh, the shared rural network agreement right through to uh, the UK gig gigabit program and I'm sure Matt will uh, give us more context on, on both the government's progress to date, but also their ambitions uh, in future uh, in a moment. Um, but there is also much more to do. And um, today, I, I guess we want to talk about how greater connectivity can um, support in particular this, this core challenge that the government has set itself of, of levelling up. How can we ensure that the benefits of connectivity don't just benefit major cities, um, but also post-industrial towns uh, where growth and productivity has perhaps lagged behind in recent decades. How can we not only create that infrastructure, but also make sure people use it um, by encouraging take up and supporting new types of innovation? And how, as we approach a spending review next year now and a national infrastructure plan um, very soon, how can we better recognize the value of digital infrastructure investment um, and also lever leverage much greater private capital to, um, to upgrade our systems. Um, to get into some of those questions, and I'm sure many more, um, we have a fantastic panel. Um, so I've already mentioned that we have Matt Warman here. Matt is the minister responsible for digital infrastructure. Um, he was previously uh, digital minister in the department and has been covering technology um, since uh, long before he entered uh, Parliament in 2015 um, uh, as technology correspondent with the Telegraph, uh, where he interviewed various people, including Tim Berners-Lee uh, and Jeff Bezos. Um, second, we are going to hear from Jo Gideon. Um, jo uh, is the MP for Stoke-on-Trent Central. Um, she was elected at the election last year, so she is very much a kind of Red Wall MP. Um, she's also a member of Onwards Leveling Up Task Force, which I'm delighted about. Um, and uh, Jo has been uh, in the past, before she entered Parliament, a businesswoman, and she's also focused very heavily on how digital can um, support uh, Stoke-on-Trent in particular, but the levelling up agenda more generally. Um, thirdly, we will hear from Nick Jeffrey, who is Chief Executive of Vodafone UK. Um, uh, he was appointed in 2016 to that role, and before that was Chief Executive of Cable and Wireless Worldwide after Vodafone acquired that business. Um, he also sits on the COVID Recovery Commission, um, which was recently convened to bring industrial expertise to uh, the challenge of reconstructing the country after COVID. Um, and uh, I'm sure Nick will say this, but uh, Vodafone has been very active in recent weeks publishing uh, a series of reports uh, on how digital can support the recovery. And our final speaker will be Alan Mack, MP. Um, Alan will be known to many of you as, um, I think, the key champion in Parliament of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, there he is uh, setting his background to the APPG to uh, for 4IR um, that he was the founding chairman of. Um, uh, he is the MP for Havant and, and is also a vice chair of the uh, Conservative Party. Um, uh, and so someone who is, is plugged into lots of these conversations at a political and a policy 
level. So an amazing panel. Um, and in a moment, I will shut up and hand over to them because they're the real experts here. But before I do that, just very quickly, um, three housekeeping rules, same for every Onward event. Firstly, if you've got a question, please ask it. Please feel free to do that as speakers are speaking um, in the chat function or the Q&A. I will then read out those questions to the, um, to the panel after they've spoken. Um, secondly, this is for our speakers. If you can mute yourself when you're not talking and unmute yourself when you are, uh, so when you when you uh, when you are, so um, so that uh, people can hear you, but also so that there's no background uh, feedback uh, loops on uh, other people's remarks. And finally, um, I will close this session promptly at, at one p.m. I know the minister needs to go slightly earlier than that, and I will um, uh, kind of stop stop us at twelve forty-five to allow him to depart. But we will carry on the discussion until one p.m. and then I will release you all to your busy afternoons. So without further ado, um, I am delighted to introduce uh, the Minister, Matt Warman. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Will, um, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me on to uh, what I think is a genuinely really excellent uh, panel. I think uh, Alan and Nick and Joe have all got um, a really impressive uh, track record, so hopefully a really uh, good discussion. So uh, a tribute to Onward for getting us all together. Um, and apologies for being uh, that terrible person who ducks out before the end of the session, but it gives you 15 minutes to uh, say what you really think of me at the end. So uh, I, I'm glad I'm not left that bit. Um, but, so look, I think, um, Obviously, we'll uh, talk to a lot about some of the really obvious uh, stuff at the beginning. We know, uh, courtesy of COVID, uh, just how valuable uh, the internet and connectivity in general has been uh, on every aspect of our lives. And I think uh, if we uh, try and imagine what would have happened uh, if this had been COVID 20 years ago, then uh, we would, the idea of trying to conduct uh, education, trying to conduct business, trying to conduct anything, um, when the text message was the sort of limit of digital connectivity, it's simply not a, a realistic prospect. So uh, in a sense, we've both demonstrated how far we've come in terms of digital connectivity uh, over the last few years, but we've also demonstrated how essential it is and we've demonstrated um, over the course of COVID just how uh, vital it is that people who don't have the connectivity that we need uh, to, to live in the 21st century get it as soon as possible. And, and that's why I think thinking of this through a frame of levelling up is really important because uh, when it comes to digital levelling up is no respecter of geography it's no respecter of, of income or all of that you you either got it or you haven't um, and I think what we need to make sure um, is that we tackle uh, the two uh, challenges around uh, connectivity. One is the physical getting of it. It's if you live in a if you live in an urban not spot, what are we doing about that? If you live literally at the end of the line in uh, far, far too many of those uh, rural areas that don't have it, what are we doing about that? And it's horses for courses and, and Nick I'm sure uh, will talk about the vital role of, of 4G and 5G versus fixed uh, as well. Um, but uh, what I think we've also got to and what's been really uh, extraordinary through the course of the pandemic is that the actions that networks and, uh, and governments as well uh, have taken to make sure that vulnerable consumers, vulnerable children in particular, have access to uh, connectivity because the benefits uh, of being online if you are a uh, if you're a school child who doesn't uh, have the connectivity or didn't have the kit is something the government has been really alive to but it's also something that the networks have made really huge strides in with tariffs for vulnerable consumers specifically with commitments to making sure uh, that people were not uh, disconnected at a really pivotal time um, even though of course it's important to make sure the bills uh, do ultimately get paid so uh, I think there's been an extraordinary demonstration uh, over the course of COVID that both uh, makes us look at the reality of what the future of connectivity has to look like, but also the reality of making sure that there is um, a degree of access to it that reflects the approach that we've taken uh, historically with uh, tariffs, for, with social tariffs for uh, uh, universal connectivity when it comes to traditional phone line connection. So I think there's been there's been a lot to think about uh, on that. Um, but it doesn't in some ways change the sort of fundamentals that were already there in the 2019 election. They were already there in the government's program um, over a, a number of years. And so just to talk a little bit about, about that, 
What I think um, you've seen, obviously, is huge progress um, over the last few years, getting to 96% super fast coverage, getting to uh, just the other day, uh, one third of the country now has access to gigabit capable networks. That is a huge stride compared to where we were a few years ago. And the acceleration is certainly going to continue um, for the next uh, few years, um, in part thanks to Virgin's uh, upgrades to its networks, in part thanks to the mobile networks increasingly rolling out 5G. So there's a lot of that that will have to continue. If you look at the, uh, the gigabit voucher, for instance, making really significant inroads into areas where previously uh, we simply wouldn't have been able to deploy uh, any kind of connectivity in demonstrate what happens when communities can come together. You look at things like the Community Fiber Partnership, you look at things like the Shared Rural Network, um, where it's a billion pounds of government and private sector money producing really uh, so some, some results already, but if we look at where we'll be in a few years' time, producing a really significant expansion uh, of 4G coverage. But taken together, we also know that all of this is not enough. Um, we also know uh, that uh, the reason why the government has talked at such length about what we'll be do what we'll be doing with the five billion pound investment in the final twenty percent is because ultimately, as I said, if you haven't got the connectivity you need, you're certainly not going to be able to do the basics as a consumer or as a parent or, or whatever. But perhaps more important you're not going to be able to start the business that relies on uh, really uh, decent connectivity. You're not going to be able to take advantage of the data revolution that 5G will enable. You're not going to be a part uh, of uh, the fourth industrial revolution that Alan has done so much to promote uh, in Parliament. And I think that's a really interesting example um, of where when, when Alan and I were both elected in 2015, when um, we came in, I think uh, the understanding of what even the fourth industrial revolution in parliament was incredibly limited it's thanks to work uh, like alan's appg that means that um, it is now uh, it's embarrassing if you don't know what it is so uh, that that's that's real progress and i think um, it underlines why that five billion pounds is so important it is as much about business and job creation um, spread more fairly across the country than it is about uh, a, a sort of traditional consumer connectivity um, so just to talk a little bit about this 5 billion, I said at the select committee the other day that we'll be uh, talking in more detail towards the end of this year about what the procurement for that looks like. Um, uh, but I think, uh, and, and uh, the end of the year is, is approaching with uh, frightening rapidity, um, certainly from, from that perspective. Um, and uh, it is, uh, what, what we've got to do uh, when we talk about that, I think is say, look, there are obviously some uh, parts of the country where this is about extending existing coverage. If you look at, but we've been sort of taking individual places to do deep dives on what does the current approach that we're thinking of taking mean for Swindon? What does it mean for Bishop Auckland? What does it mean for a business park on the outside of uh, a sort of uh, may, maybe a sort of slightly more generic setting for, for that one? What does it mean for Northern Ireland? That all, all try, try and sort of really stress test um, some of this. And it will be horses for courses. But in terms of uh, the overall approach, what I think we've got to do very quickly is demonstrate to people that uh, there is not going to be any part of the country that is left behind. Some people will have to wait a little bit longer, of course, because physics and, and, and geography mean that some places are harder to do than others. But the commitment to genuine levelling up in a digital sense, I think not only do we have a chance to demonstrate with the five billion that we are putting our money where our mouth is, but we also have the chance to say to industry, um, as quickly as it can be rolled out, government will be supporting this. And whether and, and we're technology neutral um, on, on that in, in, in that sense, whether it is fiber, whether it is 5G, whether it is fixed wireless, I don't know, I, I don't think anyone um, within reason uh, cares about the method by which they get their uh, connection. They care about the fact that it finds gets uh, to allow them to allow to be able to do what they need to do. Um, so, so that's a bit of a flavour um, of where we are coming from at the moment. I'm very happy to answer uh, questions and uh, as I say uh, apologies for uh, disappearing off uh, slightly early but really looking forward to hearing from uh, other panellists in a minute. Thank you. Matt thank you very much and, and, a, and a real commitment to use 
digital uh, to support the leveling up agenda and to, um, as you say, not just give uh, consumers a, a kind of a faster connection for their YouTube clips, but uh, but also supporting jobs and businesses in the places where they have been lacking in the past. Um, a very, very welcome set of remarks indeed. Um, Joe, can I now come to you to kind of follow on from that and, and to talk a little bit perhaps about what that might mean for Stoke and what you're looking for um, as from the leveling up agenda in this space? Yes, thank you very much, Will, and I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this discussion, and, and I agree with, with uh, a huge amount of what the, the Minister said. Um, as you know, I've talked a lot about social infrastructure uh, in terms of levelling up, but um, I have to say, um, the late great Steve Jobs once said, technology is nothing. What is important is that you have faith in people, and that they are good and smart, and if you give them the right tools, they'll do wonderful things. And this goes to the heart of why digital infrastructure sits at the, at the core of our levelling up agenda. Levelling up is as much about creating opportunity, productivity and ambition across all parts of the country as it is about tackling the, the economic and social inequalities that hold people back. And it's about empowering our communities with the right tools and opportunities that they need to harness the, these possibilities that the technology affords them to achieve these wonderful things. Um, Stoke-on-Trent, as you know, are world leaders in ceramics manufacturing. It's been at the heart of research and innovation for, for almost 300 years. However, it is the case that whilst factories such as Spode, Royal Dalton, Dudson and, and Wedgwood remain household names, there's been a, a steep decline in the demand for traditional ceramic goods and, you know, factories have closed. Fast forward to today and you'll see that pottery is not just our past, it's our present and our future. Uh, Port Marion, Emma Bridgewater and Wade all manufacture in Stoke Central, my constituency, and export around the world. However, that's just the tip of the iceberg in what we can achieve. The, the talent, skills and natural ability of our agile workforce remain largely untapped. And with the rollout of better connectivity and a world-class 5G network across the city, we will be able to open so many doors for businesses, entrepreneurs and investors to come to our city and fully utilise and harness the capabilities of our workforce. I, I'll give you an example of businesses working within our advanced ceramics industry, such as Lucidian in Penkel, um, are, are really at, at the, 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 the cutting edge of um, R&D for advanced materials um, in ceramics. And this is, is, is hugely important for supply chains across a, a huge range of sectors, including automotive, aerospace, uh, healthcare, defense, and renewable energy sectors. This industry is already a £2 billion market in the UK alone. And with better connectivity across the region, we can attract further investment to the city, including the development of a, a world-leading advanced ceramics campus here in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and we do have a strategic vision and a framework for making Stoke-on-Trent the most digitally advanced city in the UK. We call it Silicon Stoke. The foundations are already in place with, with funding support from the government the installation of a 104 kilometre wide um, full fibre gigacity network is scheduled for completion in spring 2021. So the city is positioned superbly to have an early mover advantage in achieving comprehensive 5G coverage. We already have a business case for 5G that would allow us to go to market with a reasonably, within a reasonably short time frame. And we'd like to see a, a full fibre canopy Academy in partnership with Stoke-on-Trent College and our secondary schools that will train our young people and older adults wishing to retrain in installation skills, including hands-on field experience. We want to maximise the use of apprenticeships, the Kickstart programme and opportunities for local contractors. And we also see the need for the expansion and extension of our existing enterprise zone, including a redesignation as a digital enterprise zone to ensure that the city gets full benefit from the realisation of the full fibre network. We're going to create a digital innovation hub to support new and expanding digital businesses through the provision of know-how, shared services and venture capital, and work with schools, colleges and universities to develop the right pathways for digital skills leading to job opportunities. And we have a vision um, for, uh, to, to create the sort of gaming equivalent of the Brit School in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, this would be a regional free school for 14 to 18 year olds um, with a commitment to develop specialist skills in different elements of game design, 
creation and production and marketing. And, and, and our university already is, is a leading university in, um, in gaming. Um, in addition to that, I mean, we'd, we, we, we think more broadly, we'd, we'd like um, NHS England and NHS Digital to adopt the city as a national exemplar for digital en enabled um, health and care, making full use of the open access full fibre network connectivity and including dark fibre if required for ultra sensitive, ultra secure uh, dedicated data transfer. So really levelling up is, is about far more than we see on the surface. We, we, we look at it quite often in terms of discussing physical and concrete infrastructure, but it's about using these new technologies to kickstart local economies where they're needed most. So digital infrastructure, I think, provides massive opportunities. Uh, I mean, in, you know, in terms of remote working, education, healthcare, security, civic engagement, renewable energy, there are, there are just so many sectors. And I think, truly that it's a game changer for places like Stoke-on-Trent. So I do hope that we get um, our fair share of, of advanced investment in the city. <laughs> that's, that's my pitch to the Minister. <laughs> jo, thank you so much. Um, and uh, just really fantastic to hear you talk about things in kind of concrete terms. So talking about the kind of institutions and the uh, and things like digital enterprise zones, the, the kind of practical policies that can allow us to uh, to link this kind of amazing technology and the kind of advances in terms of innovation with uh, the kind of practical growth and and, and social and, uh, and economic innovation on the ground. So thank you. Um, Nick, I'm now going to come to you um, for your remarks. So Bodevin, as I said at the beginning, has been doing lots and lots of work in this space, and you're obviously one of the leading uh, companies uh, too. So I'd just love to hear your perspective and how how you match what you do with the government's leveling up agenda and how we can do more together yeah thank you thank you will and, and thanks to matt and, and joe and alan for joining us on on this and great great to hear your your views so let me start up front by saying that, that i've got a very clear vision for for britain and that's for it to become a true leading digital economy it's one of the few ways frankly where britain can project uh, and punch uh, above its weight in the global economy. Uh, and of course, critical to that is having the digital infrastructure necessary to do that. And like uh, has been mentioned already, and so many of you I'm sure already recognize, I think the penny has really dropped during the pandemic that the digital infrastructure of our country is important in all aspects of our life and uh, of course, the government and its ability to project policy and really deliver on its agenda of economic recovery, leveling up, um, more social uh, opportunity and so on. Um, and in fact, just looking at our own traffic during the pandemic, we've seen a 30% increase in data traffic. Uh, we've seen a 25% increase on traffic on our fixed networks because Vodafone is not just a mobile operator and a 42% increase in voice traffic. And in fact, just uh, when we went into the second lockdown, in fact, the day we went into it, we saw more data traffic on our network than we've ever had in our entire 33 year history. And I think it was perhaps people staying at home and watching Netflix, I don't know, but whatever it was, it was very measurable on our networks. And, and like I think the sector has done more broadly, uh, it's a real credit to, to this industry that uh, we can be so resilient and flexible when people need us most. But about having said that, I think the story of um, the opportunity that I believe in is really one of both opportunity and threat. And what we thought at Vodafone on reflecting on this was uh, rather than just punting a uh, fairly bland policy ideas at government in the hope that some of them stick, why didn't we knuckle down and actually provide some hard economic analysis that can help build the business case to deliver the digital infrastructure that the economy and we all need? And so we, as you rightly say, have been busily putting out reports, uh, the first of which really looked at the economic potential that could be unlocked across the UK by having a better digital infrastructure. So from that report, uh, we identified there's about 150 billion pounds of untapped economic potential. 
you know, there's, there's about 12 billion in the Northwest, about four and a half billion in Manchester, about 9.3 billion in Scotland and so on. In areas that only if they had the infrastructure they need, people could work more productively, more small businesses could be started, uh, existing physical businesses could go online and so on. And from that came initiatives like the shared rural network that Matt mentioned, where we're aiming to make sure that coverage is really extended geographically over the next few years to cover the not spots that I know frustrate everybody and frustrate us just as much. The second report, which we're launching today, focuses a little bit more on the threat that's particularly been posed through the pandemic, where of course digital businesses have continued to thrive and accelerate, but as Joe rightly mentioned, there are less digital businesses that have unquestionably uh, been hit and become economically dislocated uh, in a period where, where without the infrastructure they need to thrive in a more digital world that we're all living in, uh, they really suffer. And again, using some ex-treasury economists, we've quantified that downside value of being about 15 billion in terms of lost economic impact, uh, about 37,000 uh, digital economy jobs at risk, and about 10,000 digital businesses, the vast majority of which unfortunately will be small businesses that are at threat by not having uh, a truly competitive and next generation mobile and fixed network digital infrastructure to let them survive and thrive. So I think our role here is not just as a simple standalone provider of the infrastructure that the company, the country uh, needs and companies need to thrive in the future. But we're also trying to catalyze our industry and give government the real tools that it needs to work hand in hand with us to develop specific tangible policy outcomes, many of which Matt has already mentioned, that can let us work hand in hand with government to accelerate the deployment of the digital infrastructure we need to both unlock value and protect us and particularly small businesses and jobs from downside. And then in the meantime, we've got an important role as an industry and Vodafone has as a company to protect the vulnerable with things like free data for NHS workers, for the vulnerable, uh, the package we've just launched this week uh, to support those who unfortunately find themselves unemployed as a result of, uh, of COVID impacts and so on. And I think that's a role that our sector needs to take very, very seriously. Uh, as hand in hand with that, we're also working with government to look at ways we can accelerate things and come back to my start point, which is really the vision that I certainly hold very strongly that the UK should be a leading digital economy. That's within our grasp. We know how to do it. Collectively, we have the resources to make that real. So our job is to try and make that tangible and deliverable. Uh, Nick, thank you very much. And um, uh, I think we can all heartily agree uh, with the vision for the UK to become a leading uh, digital economy. But it's really, really interesting to hear some of the numbers that you have crunched um, and both in terms of the untapped potential, uh, the, the kind of the reward, but also some of the risk. Um, so thank you very much, Nick, for that. Um, Alan, you've been waiting very patiently. Can I now uh, turn to you um, uh, to I'd love to hear more about what you think on all of this, but particularly how you think it relates to the fourth industrial revolution, which I know is your special suit. Yeah, great. Thanks to Will and everyone at Onward for organising today's event. Really important event. And I think Onward has made a huge impact in Westminster and Whitehall since its foundation by Will and others. So thank you for convening it. And it's great to be with so many accomplished colleagues. Um, Joe obviously made a big impact and is now PPS at, at Bayes, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. Um, Nick and Vodafone, who are actually founding partners of the uh, sponsor partners of the APBG, so we're grateful for them for their support. And of course, Matt, um, who's playing such a great leadership role in helping to deliver uh, all of this. And Matt was himself an officer of the APBG before his um, elevation to greatness. So I'm obviously grateful to, to Matt for all, all, all the energy that he's put, put into this. And uh, as you rightly say, Will, um, the key to um, boosting connectivity and leveling up and raising living standards and creating jobs and boosting wages, which is not only the ambition of the government and the party, but actually of, of all of us, is actually to invest in the fourth industrial revolution to boost digital connectivity and to make sure that the digital divide um, that has started to emerge isn't one that actually grows any bigger 
Um, Britain was a world leader in the first industrial revolution, as Joe said, places like Stoke, Manchester, um, uh, most parts of the north where I'm from were world leading in um, innovation uh, and production in the first industrial revolution. Many of the economic challenges that we face today are as a result of the UK not leading the second and third industrial revolutions. We weren't the world leaders in mass production. Uh, we weren't the world leaders um, in electrification. Uh, but in this new fourth industrial revolution where um, the economy will be built on knowledge, digital connectivity, tech, um, biotech, all the things that Joe mentioned, advanced manufacturing, um, some of the things that Matt's trying to do in DCMS, we have that opportunity to become the world leaders. And if we want to do that, the key thing that we have to do is to make sure this connectivity boon, uh, the broadband, the 5G that Matt's department is working on is available to everybody. Because if we don't, what can happen is that those areas that are productive and digitally connected will race ahead uh, at an unprecedented speed, uh, more so than the previous industrial revolutions, where growth and wealth was created by road, railways, canals, and viaducts, which took months or years to build. Digital connectivity can accelerate in weeks and months. And actually, if we don't invest regionally across the whole country, then the digital divide will exacerbate and there'll be massive winners of the 4IR, and there'll be substantial losers. And the entrenched um, situation that we have at the moment will only get worse. So digital connectivity has to be for everybody. We need to make sure that um, the whole country benefits from the country's move towards leading the fourth industrial revolution. And there are a couple of um, policy areas that I think uh, where we can make a big difference. The first is that um, we can empower city mayors, councils, and LEPs to help businesses um, in their areas to adopt digital technology. The fact is that when new technologies and new connectivity opportunities emerge, the first movers often get a big advantage because they um, are very well versed with technology, they uh, move quickly, they adopt it, and they integrate it and they use it. So if you're a manufacturer, and you upgrade your diesel powered um, machine tool to an AI powered green uh, machine tool, you will get a productivity uh, increase. Uh, whereas if you don't, you will fall behind uh, more and more. And that's why giving um, local councils, um, devolved administrations, and LEPs the opportunity to take control regionally of their digital adoption strategy is, that is absolutely key. Um, there are some regions of the country that have already started to do this. The Liverpool City region has launched the LCR 4.0 initiative, which is where they use money that government is giving them to bring together a package of funding, but also skills training and targeted mentoring to help businesses in that area to upgrade their technology. Um, in Hull and East Yorkshire, um, the Spark Fund has been launched to help businesses uh, in that part of the world to upgrade their technology and not fall behind. And there are other um, initiatives starting to um, take root, but ultimately it's an opportunity for local councils and LEPs and county councils and regional mayors to really um, step up and take responsibility. Um, governments can create the framework, it can provide funding, it can provide a lead, but it can't do everything. And actually every region is slightly different, whether you're an advanced manufacturing area like Joe's or you specialize in um, f farming, hospitality, and other areas like constituencies like Matt and I represent, you have to have a bespoke uh, opportunity. And therefore, it is an opportunity for local councils and others to use this COVID pandemic as, an op as a reason to press the fast forward button on uh, digital adoption. And I've called for every county and borough and district council to appoint a cabinet member to take responsibility for digital connectivity and ensuring their area leads in the fourth industrial revolution for their for their region. Um, some areas have already started to do that. I've got my own council has done that. I know there are opportunities for others um, to do that. Uh, secondly, um, as Nick's Vodafone report shows, um, we need to make sure that people have the skills to take advantage of all this digital connectivity. Um, the government is doing a huge amount from broadband rollout to the digital strategy to um, all sorts of trading. But actually, if you can't understand and use this new technology, whether it's 5G broadband or quantum computing at its most advanced stage, then it's not really going to be very helpful. So Nick's report um, with Vodafone has really um, highlighted an important area, which is digital skills, which Joe also mentioned, 
Uh, we need to empower people to actually be able to use computers um, and also advanced technologies like CRM, um, computer-aided design, consumer relationship management tools, um, basic AI. So these are all things that we actually need to focus on in the next couple of years to try and make sure that the workforce is as skilled as the machinery and the technology that is permeating workplaces and businesses um, increasingly around the country. Um, and finally, I think we need to, in government, help create a regulatory system uh, and a fiscal system that actually encourages people to adopt technology quickly and to um, embrace connectivity. Um, one of the main tools is the capital allowance system, and I've been calling on the Chancellor to make sure that um, the £1 million annual limit is either kept uh, or at least um, it's retained for digital tools. So at the moment, there's often um, uh, some queries as to whether things like um, buying server space and digital tools can be tax deductible. I think this Chancellor has actually understood this very clearly and actually is reforming that. Um, but if you can write off tax for buying um, a machine, a physical machine um, or a computer, you should be able to do that for software as well and for other digital tools. So those are some of the areas that um, need to be looked at in the spending review and the next, next budget. But the key to helping Britain to harness more connectivity is having a regional approach where regional leaders working with businesses and providers like Vodafone take responsibility for coming up with a strategy for their own area and Matt and his team at DCMS are providing a lot of funding and structure and guidance but actually it is time for us to harness the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution by making sure that we harness it at a regional and local level. Thank you. Thank you very much Alan and uh, fantastic and it just it bring, really brings it to life thinking about how this can actually relate to some of that kind of transformational industrial change that's happening in the economy. Um, uh, so I've been reliably informed by my team that uh, I got my timing slightly wrong and we will finish at 12.45 rather than one o'clock because I realised that a number of speakers need to go at 12.45. So we are going to race through some questions. Um, thank you to everyone who has, um, has submitted them via the chat and the Q&A functions um, and I'm going to group them into three and fire them at specific speakers in the interests of of time if that's if that's all right so i think there is there is a very clear theme coming out in a number of the questions about what peter rockner calls the digital deficit or uh, what other people might call the digital divide i.e those people who are connected and able to make use of all this digital capability and those who aren't either because their children don't have laptops as he says or as alan uh, referred to just there some people just don't have the skills. Um, I thought I might come to the Minister particularly on this because clearly a big part of levelling up, I mean the Prime Minister talks about giving everyone the opportunity to go uh, as far as their talents will take them as, as uh, no matter what their background is. Um, is there something we need to do there beyond what you're already doing in order to ensure that everyone can uh, benefit from uh, these skills? And I might, Matt, I'll come to you but I might also come to Nick if that's all right um, and then uh, I'll have another set of questions that I'll, I'll bring Alan and Joe in, in, in on. Uh, no, thanks. I mean, in some ways, this is the only question that matters, right? Because there is no point in connecting half the country at, 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 at whatever expense um, if you can't uh, get the access uh, to it, uh, to, to, to the benefits that that connectivity affords. Um, I, I think that the, the government has done and is going to continue to do uh, a huge amount, but ultimately the real challenge with this is that there is no silver bullet. There is no, there, there, part of it is about, um, as Alan mentioned, digital champions within local government doing things at the really uh, sort of local level. Part of it is about schools, part of it is about getting people devices. Um, I think um, from, from a DCMS point of view, we, we do think a huge part of this is obviously about schools. It is obviously about the work that DfE uh, has has done and is doubling down on, if you like. But but actually, we, to say that misses a huge uh, sort of uh, part of the iceberg, which is uh, older people who are not sort of not the sort of typical people who are in their seventies and eighties who who are not online. It's people who are in their sort of fifties and sixties who are not really getting the benefits. So where you've seen a lot of the what Prime Minister has been talking about. about 
about retraining, about lifelong learning, about all, all that sort of stuff. There has to be a huge focus um, in making in making get deriving the benefits uh, of being online as, as a part of that. And I think one of the things that's been interesting uh, about this is is yes, it's what can you do in schools. Yes, it's what can you do through libraries. Yes, it's what can you get employers to do, partly acting in their own interests. But there are other things that you can do that, that feel softer and, and less significant. And for instance, it's about uh, huge numbers of people who buy, uh, who have a mobile phone, who have a smartphone, um, but use it for in very, very limited ways. What can we do working with uh, the providers like Vodafone, but, but obviously there, there are others, and say, when you go into that shop and buy that phone, when you get it, when you get it sent to your house, how can you nudge people to just go that bit further? Um, uh, so, so I think it, it really does need uh, what I think is euphemistically called a full spectrum response, um, which, which is not, uh, not to say that it's, it shouldn't be any one person's problem ultimately uh, but we do have to make sure that we are really pulling every lever because uh, you can give uh, vulnerable households laptops as we have done in the pandemic if they don't have the skills to use them then, then it's, it's, it's not really uh, going to do you much good so uh, it is as I say the only question that matters but the, uh, the, the these are really hard yards um, and we've got to make sure that the government is all pulling in the same direction. Thank you, Matt. Um, Nick, uh, I'd love to hear from you on this question, and particularly, I mean, the, the minister just said, is there more that companies like Vodafone can do? What what could Vodafone do? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, I'll, I'll break it down. The question is access, and there are, there's really two things to think about when we, when we consider access. The first of all is having the availability of high-speed broadband and 5G mobile networks in the first place. Uh, and there, I think there are a lot of there's a lot of good work already going on with the shared rural network initiative that Matt's mentioned and is a cross industry initiative with government to fill in the places where there aren't networks today. But then when we look at uh, why don't we build these things faster, there are, there are really two things to call out. The first of which is on physical broadband connections. I think the UK has now done a, a good job and we're building at a rate that's as fast as it, it is possible for a country to go, given the need to have skilled labor, digging up the streets and all of that stuff. Um, I think we could go faster on deploying high-speed mobile networks, which can be done more quickly uh, and deliver broadly equivalent high-speed uh, digital networks. So then the question becomes, well, wh why aren't we doing that? And, and there, I think it's right to point out that the UK is actually a relatively low return on investment market compared to other economies. And therefore, uh, we are simply not attracting the level of investment in the UK that we would do in other European or Asian or American uh, economies. And that's an area where I think uh, government together with the regulator really can work to figure out how we build an investment driven um, uh, economic model for the digital economy that encourages people to invest in the infrastructure that we need in order to help the economy thrive. So I think there are uh, certainly things that can be done there that will support uh, a better long-term inward investment uh, infrastructure driven uh, economy. Uh, I noticed one of the questions was about coverage on trains, by the way, so I'll just hit that on the head. Uh, we'd love to build more coverage on trains. Uh, I think we need the train operators to actually work with us on that in a slightly more constructive way than perhaps uh, has been the case in the past. I'm hopeful that will happen. It's certainly not any lack of desire from the, the mobile network operators, uh, nor is it a lack of money to do it. The second thing on access is really uh, giving uh, vulnerable children, the elderly, uh, disadvantaged access to devices, training and skills and so on in order to use those networks when they are available so they can start businesses, educate themselves, and, and really deliver that leveling up agenda that I know is so important uh, and right at the moment. Uh, there, I think there is lots we can do. Um, I, I would say watch this space uh, for uh, initiatives we've not yet announced, but certainly things like uh, providing free data to the NHS and to the vulnerable throughout the pandemic has been an example, uh, together with our initiative to support the unfortunately growing number of unemployed people who are hit as a result of the pandemic. So there, I think industry standalone is doing a lot. We can do more uh, on, on underlying infrastructure access. I think we have to work hand in hand with governments and regulators to make the UK a place where everybody would want to invest. 
Uh, Nick, thank you very much. And I should say that I think, Matt, you you definitely need to shoot off now. I'm going to try and in the in the last 30 or 40 seconds, squeeze in a couple of uh, questions to, to Alan and Joe. But Matt, if you need to depart, uh, we totally understand. And just one word of thanks to thank you so much for, for joining us and giving up your time, especially at a busy time like this. Uh, thank, thank, thank you ever so much for having me. Um, and uh, thank you for putting together such a good panel. Thank you, Matt. Thank, yeah. Lovely. Thanks. Um, okay, well, so uh, I'm conscious of people's diaries, but I'm going to try and um, uh, get in some of these questions because they are really genuinely good and material questions to the challenge. And I hope people won't mind if I stretch diaries a couple of minutes to count to, to count, uh, look at them. So Alan and Joe in particular, there have been a few questions about um, the role of institutions. Now, Joe, you talked a little bit about uh, about uh, kind of colleges and um, uh, institutions. There's one question particularly about how uh, Staffordshire University could be used as an institution in order to, to drive um, uh, greater um, connectivity, particularly um, using its expertise in game design for the de development of that uh, digital skill. Um, uh, and, and equally, there's a, there are kind of a number of conversations about the role of uh, institutions in in actually the challenge we were just talking about and kind of improving access and, mm -hmm. uh, and and kind of spreading the benefits to to different groups of people i just wondered um uh, and sorry i should just also link to what you were saying alan about the role of local government and leps as well how can we do more to empower those institutions because they sit in local level they, they are the people who are kind of connecting um uh, businesses and individuals to lots of this capability what more do those institutions need in order to have best effect locally because clearly that's one of the things that's going to drive adoption and um, accelerate some of this transformation at local level if i could come to joe first and then alan if that's right yeah i mean you know staffordshire university played a leading role in fact they 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 have a um a proposal into government on 5g across the whole of staffordshire which is hugely ambitious um, and uh, th there is there is clearly a, a role for for joined up thinking and um, this is the case I think across the the whole leveling up piece if you like um, but education plays such a, a, a vital role both in including the digitally excluded um, in helping people you know who um, maybe sort of missed it the first time round to, to, to retrain and, and to learn, uh, but also to design a future for our young people where they're training and, and, and learning for the right jobs for the future. Because I think that's key that, that technology is moving at such a pace that, that even you know, things that maybe five years ago we thought were, were going to be career options now you know, look maybe not as relevant. Um, you know, things like AI and, and uh, I mean, the, 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 there's just so much in development and, and, and gaming is, 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 as I mentioned before, a big thing in, uh, in, in Staffs Uni, but there are so many new career opportunities emerging. And I think that, uh, you know, especially now as we've got such high levels of unemployment, people have to look at, at a complete change of, um, of opportunities. And so, uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us to maybe uh, let's say, you know, have a, have a task force to look at the opportunities that digital will present and how we can maybe design something that, that will engage the, the, the largest number of people from across all sectors. Thank you very much, Joe. And Alan, could I ask you to quickly come on on this and then I will have to bring it to a close, unfortunately, but Alan. Yeah, I think there are really three things that, that can be done um, institutionally wise. And I think um, universities are a good convener of this. The Spark Fund that I mentioned um, in East Yorkshire is actually run by the University of Hull. Um, in the Tees Valley, the Digital City Programme is run by Teesside University. So they're good conveners because they're seen as um, expert, but not really um, biased uh, towards any business or sector. So they're, they're good. So I think there's really three quick things that can be done at an institutional and a regional level. The first, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, is to have accountability and have individuals who are accountable for leading this in their own region. It might be a council cabinet member, it might be a university um, deputy vice chancellor, it might be someone in authority, but I think having somebody whose job at a LEP or university level to, to help deliver a digital connectivity and rollout is very important. I think secondly, you have to have a, have a plan. When I was at Bayes, um, we had the industrial strategy, but we also had ambitions for the local industrial strategies, which I haven't really seen too many of those, but I think there's a real role for those. Uh, and I think um, thirdly, um, having um, the ability to uh, bring together businesses in, in these institutions 
uh, lots of leps and others are dominated by um, there's nothing wrong with these these types of people but sort of academics and others I think having real businesses particularly SMEs at the, at the coal face is very important as well as larger multinationals that, are, that can be enable technology like Vodafone I think is very important. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, and thank you to all of our panellists, um, uh, to Nick, uh, to Joe, uh, and to Alan, and, and to the minister, of course, who's had to part early. It, I mean, it has been, it's been a, a kind of quick, but um, but really deep and comprehensive discussion. It's felt like we've um, been incredibly optimistic about the potential value um, and uh, and and the, the kind of rewards that will follow from uh, doing some of the good things, but also quite practical in lots of the things we've discussed, talking about the specific specific institutions that we need to engage, the specific um, types of schemes that can improve access uh, and, um, and also the specific uh, types of investment that are going to have the, have the best effect. It feels like um, this is an incredibly exciting agenda, but also just a critical thing for the government to be thinking about as they um, uh, think about not just kind of levelling up in general, but also coming out of the pandemic, um, uh, assuming that reports of the vaccine uh, effectiveness this week are true um, and, uh, and moving towards um, uh, a more um, uh, yeah, a more connected uh, and more regionally balanced economy in future. So um, uh, thank you all for giving up your time. Um, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Um, uh, and thank you in particular uh, to Vodafone for supporting us to do this event. Um, uh, genuinely incredibly worthwhile. And I know that I took lots from it and I hope others did too. Um, so uh, I'm going to close the session now. Thank you for um, being flexible uh, with diaries. And uh, I look forward to engaging with you all in future. Thank you.